Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Um, it's kind of funny that we decided to volunteer for this panel called the Reading and Writing the Long Poem, and we only have 50 little minutes to talk about it. <laughs> it seems like such a big subject. So we're going to try to be brief, and we're going to each talk a little bit and then maybe ask each other some things and then hopefully have some conversation with you if, if time permits. Uh, reading and writing a long poem, that's two really different things. I mean, it's one thing to read a long poem, but it's really something else to write, write one. Um, and when I started thinking about this topic, the long poem, well, how long is long? Because uh, when I started writing poetry as a kid, I was about 13, my mother gave me a little spiral notebook, which was tiny. So I wrote tiny poems to fit on that page. And then when I got to be a little more sophisticated at the age of 15, I, I got a typewriter. And so I wrote poems that fit on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. And, and when I got down near the end of the sheet, I knew you should stop the poem pretty soon. <laughs> so it, it, it sort of worked against writing long poems. I mean, I knew there were long poems, but I didn't think I could ever write one. Uh, and then when I got my first computer, there wasn't a bottom of the page. And I began writing, I finally got used to writing poetry on a computer. And then it was easier to write long poems because I didn't know where I was, quote, supposed to end. I just followed the poem itself. But um, so, uh, one thing I'd like to talk about, I'm going to talk mainly about writing long poems, uh, not so much about reading them, but <clears throat> I love reading them if they're good. And I mean, it's like once you get inside a great long poem, well, like the Iliad or the Canterbury Tales or whatever, uh, I never want to get out. It's like reading Remembrance of Things Past. Once you get past the first volume, which is very difficult, I found, and you get inside that long work, you never want to leave that universe. So I love reading long poems. Um, oh, and another one called Orlando Furioso uh, by Ariosto. It's, there's a beautiful English translation of it by, what's her name? I've forgotten now, Barbara something. It's wonderful. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so I want to make a distinction here. Oh, years ago I'd written mainly shorter poems. And I was in London, God, about 1970, I guess, and I came across this book called The, the Collins Albatross Book of Longer Poems. And I thought, you know, if I buy that book, it'll help me write a longer poem. It turns out I didn't open it for 25 years. <laughs> I was so intimidated by the thought. But, uh, but, but I, did, I had started writing longer ones. And the trick is to, for me at least, was to make a distinction between epic poems, which are obviously long, like Orlando Furioso is like 1,300 pages, uh, or the Iliad of the Odyssey, or the Roman de la Rose, or Don Juan, or the Prelude of Wordsworth. Uh, or some other really epic poems. And I think Anna's going to talk about epic poems. Uh, I'm going to talk about longer poems. A very tricky part of this title of this book is not long poems, but longer poems. <laughs> well, longer than what? You know, a haiku? And uh, so it's, it's, it's a very handy, uh, slippery concept to keep in mind and not so you don't get so intimidated by the sheer size of writing one. Um, part of the thing that determines the length, the, the sense of the long poem it's not just that there are a lot of words in it or a lot of pages. It's the scale of the poem. Uh, there's a poem by Frank O'Hara called Biotherm. And I always remembered Biotherm as a very long poem. And every time I go back and read it, I'm continually surprised by it. It's only like seven or eight or 10 pages. It's not 30 pages because the scale of that poem is so immense uh, that it's deceptive. So, so, so uh, length is n just not the sole criterion. Um, writing long poems. One thing I did finally is I told myself, I have to write a long poem. This is ridiculous. Uh, how can I be a great poet if I haven't written a long poem? Imagine if Emily Dickinson had said such a stupid <laughs> thing to herself. <laughs> would have wrecked her. Uh, but I seem to have survived it. Uh, what I did was I just made a, a dumb rule. I said, I'm going to write every day. I'm going to sit down at my desk 
every day and I'm going to write 10 pages. And it's, I don't care if it's good or bad or indifferent or if it's notational or what. I'm going to write 10 pages every day. And I did that for f five or six days. I can't remember. And I, 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 I came up with about 50 or 60 pages of material. And uh, I put it away for a while. And I went and looked at it again later. And a lot of it was, was dreck and rambling, irrelevant, boring, etc. cetera. Uh, but some of it was pretty good. <clears throat> I was surprised. So I did the obvious thing. I took out all the dreck. And I stuck the other pieces together. It's like what Juan Felipe was saying earlier. Is you, you, you tear up the pieces and you stick them together and move them around and make transitions. And uh, it turns out I did make these transitions that were very tricky, which is typical of all my work. It's actually the transitions are tricky and slippery. And, uh, but it all fit together and made this long poem, which is a lot of fun for me to read to this day, if I may congratulate myself. Uh, <laughs> Another thing I did, writing a long poem, but this was not a strategy exactly, is I was looking at uh, seed catalogs for flowers. Actually, they weren't mine. I was house-sitting, and the, the person whose house was, had all these seed catalogs coming in. I started looking at them, and the, the flowers looked pretty good in the color pictures, but what really got me was the names of the flowers, the different fabulous names these flowers have been given by the people who developed a particular breed. And just the names of these flowers were so exciting, and they, were, they started reminding me of, of girls and women that I had been in love with or devoted to, uh, including my wife and my mother and, and people I had crushes on. And I started writing this poem comparing this, this female, whoever she was, she varied during the poem, to these different flowers. And it went on and on, and it made, an, it made a long poem. And it was very easy because I just kept turning through the seed catalogs and finding <laughs> another flower. And, and so it came out to be one of the basic types of long poem, not epic, but long poem, <clears throat> is the catalog poem or the list poem. And if you look at like Whitman's works, Whitman basically is, is a, an author of, of list poems. He, he, he enumerates all these wonderful things. And that gives his poem momentum. Uh, it's very hard to write a, 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 a long poem that doesn't have a story. Story is a great armature for long poems. Or, or have a catalog or a list. I think those are the two basic ones. The other one is sort of the, the fragmentary types, like Ezra Pound's Cantos, which I see as really one big long poem. Um, and Ann Waldman's uh, long poem, Iovis, um, is that way too. Um, the other way is to find a poetic, a poetic form that will keep you, keep you going, like the, the form of using Ottava Rima, and if you use Ottava Rima, it's a self-generating form. I mean, you, you finish one stanza, and the form propels you into the next stanza almost automatically. That's what Byron used for Don Juan, and what K uh, Kenneth Koch used for his two uh, uh, long poems, Co, or A Season on Earth, and um, The Duplications. They're both wonderful comic poems. And uh, uh, Ariosto used for Orlando Furioso. It's, it's, it's a poem that has just a rhyme, a rhyme scheme that just rolls and rolls and rolls. It's a little bit like the Sestina where you have the end words and you have to use them. It kind of pulls you forward. Um, so I would recommend if you want to try, I think, I'm sure a lot of you write poetry here. Uh, and if you haven't written a long poem, give it a shot. It's, it's kind of a, it's like, instead of going to Florida, it's like going to the moon, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, Florida can be nice, I guess, but... Uh, going to the moon. Hmm. Um, let's see if I have any other gibberish remarks to make. Oh, yeah. Uh, you might want to also look at uh, Hart Crane's poem, long poem, The Bridge, and William Carlos Williams' long poem, Patterson. A Patterson that was a poem that was a book that was very thrilling to me when I was in high school. And I looked at it last year and I didn't like it. It was strange because um, I, I admire him so much. Uh, Ashbery's uh, the long poem called The Skaters, which is a masterful long poem. And James Schuyler, a poem called Hymn to Life. And of course, The Wasteland and, uh, um, uh, and foreign, foreign poets as well. Uh, Amy Césaire or Blaise Sondra's Trans-Siberian Express or Apollinaire's Zone, which is only about six pages, but it seems to cover the universe. Um, 
And then there are a couple of contemporary poets, aside from Anne, who write long poems and do it very well. One is named Clark Coolidge, who's, I think, a master of the long poem, and the other is a, a poet who, in fact, she was a chancellor until recently, named Lynn Hedginian, who's very good at writing long poems. Not everybody is, because the danger of a long poem is that you s it gets boring just because it's long. So you've got to be really good to do it. And